previous hypotheses for this. Uh, the biggest is that it is something in the gut microbiome that can talk to the cyanide for them. Another hypothesis is that it's an inherent physiological adaptation. All mammals, including you and me, can detoxify very small amounts of cyanide. It's in almonds, it's in peach pits, it's in cigarette smoke. Uh, but our pathway is pretty inefficient, and it uses uh, cysteine, a sulfur from cysteine, to transform cyanide to a detoxification product called thiocyanate. And it's been thought that this is unlikely to be the case in bamboo lemurs, that this is upregulated, uh, because there's not a lot of cysteine in the bamboo. So there has been one previous study looking at where, how cyanide is excreted by these animals. So they used scientesimo test strips that detect simply a cyanide ion on various elements, the urine, the feces, and the bamboo that they are eating. And you can see the test strips over there, they just give you a gradient of color. There's not a lot of cyanide, there's a lot of cyanide. And what was found is that uh, we have three different species of bamboo lemurs they tested here, the one in the dark color, the medium gray, and the light gray. And they're excreting some kind of form of cyanide. These test strips can't differentiate between cyanide ion, thiocyanate, or other, some other kind of cyanide-based molecule. They're excreting some form in the urine, but not really in the feces. So this tells me immediately that there's a good chance it's probably not the microbiome doing the bulk of the heavy lifting here. So my prediction to test what's going on is to look at their urine and see if they're excreting high concentrations of cyanide, free and unbound. This would imply that they have somehow modified their cellular respiration pathway to not be so inhibited by cyanide. Or they're excreting lots of thiocyanate, that detoxification product that all of us can excrete. And this would imply that they've improved our standard mammalian pathway. So to do this, to quantify the cyanide and thiocyanate in the bamboo lemur urine, I had to go out and collect urine. And then we did gas chromatography mass spectrometry um, in collaboration with Jeremy and Marta from John Jay College of Criminal Justice. And the bonus to this is that it means it's non-invasive. These are critically endangered animals. Uh, when I talk to biochemists, they say, oh, just go get a liver biopsy. I can't. <laughs> there are 600 of one of these species left alive. Um, so just to give you a quick overview of the phylogeny we're looking at, the three on the left are bamboo lemurs. The three on the right are their most closely related non-bamboo eating relatives. We have two obligate bamboo specialists, the greater bamboo lemur and its closely related golden bamboo lemur. We also have one, it's called a considered a facultative bamboo specialist. About 70% of its diet is bamboo, and it eats less of the very highly sanctionic bamboo. That's the gray bamboo lemur. And then we also have these three closely relatively closely related non-bamboo eating species. So, what do I do? I go hang out with the lemurs with a funnel and a stick. <laughs> <laughs> and I wait for them to pee. And this is my excellent research field assistant here, Jean-Claude, who got very good at seeing when the lemur was about to pee. <laughs> As a quick aside here, can't be too long, uh, bamboo lemurs seem to pee in technicolor. It will come out in normal pee colors that you're used to, but sometimes it comes out hot pink or Fanta orange, or sometimes it seems to oxidize to a pink color. I don't know why, this has never been recorded in before, and if you have any ideas, please hit me up later. <laughs> so, onto the cyanide. Cyanide is quite volatile. As I mentioned, it's a very small molecule. It leaves solution into the air very easily. This means that I have to freeze the samples as soon as possible. Um, that's a little bit challenging in the field. We worked out a way to do it, and then we shipped them back also frozen. Um, despite freezing them immediately, or clo as close to immediately upon collection as possible, that immediately varied depending on how far the lemurs were away from camp. Um, there was some loss of cyanide and thiocyanate um, based on the time it took until they were frozen. So the numbers I'm going to show you here are based on a correction for that linear, significant linear relationship. Um, the significance of the results doesn't change without that correction, though. So, after all of this work, what is actually in there? So here's, the next slide is going to be a single graph that's the culmination of about a year and a half of work. So here we go. Same order in the phylogeny here, the three on the left on your 
left are, are bamboo lemurs, the two on the far left are the obligate bamboo specialists, the three on the right are the non-bamboo eating species. And in green we have cyanide concentrations, in orange we have thiocyanate, that detoxification product concentration. And as you can see, well the non-bamboo eating species aren't excreting either. No surprise there, but it's good to know that lemurs don't spontaneously generate cyanide. Um, then the other thing you can see is that these guys are excreting, the ones that do eat cyanide, are excreting very high concentrations of both cyanide and thiocyanate. So to give you a little bit of context for how high these concentrations are, let's zoom in on them. And these two lines, so there's not a lot of work, experimental work, on how much cyanide and thiocyanate is excreted in the urine um, in a lot of different species. So for reference, these are the amount of cyanide and thiocyanate you would expect to see in a human urine um, when they, in the case of the cyanide, the green line, in human urine when they are dying or have died of cyanide poisoning, and in the case of the thiocyanate, the orange line, when they're at the border between chronic cyanide poisoning and a point where they would no longer be able to support the kind of detoxification to survive the amount of cyanide they're eating. So as you can see here, these lemurs are excreting both more cyanide and more thiocyanate than we would expect a human to ever be able to process and excrete. So what does this tell me based on my predictions? They're excreting both. Um, I, this was a big surprise to me uh, because I expected them to be using just a single mechanism to deal with the cyanide they're eating. So let's look at what this means. It means that somehow cyanide is no longer inhibiting cellular respiration the way it would in another mammal. And it means that something about the, the detoxification pathway that all of us mammals have has been either modified to be able to detoxify more with a single enzyme or upregulated such that they have more of these enzymes. But this presents a couple of questions. As I said before, this pathway requires cysteine. There's not a lot of cysteine in bamboo, so where are they getting it? They don't know yet. The other issue here is that thiocyanate, this detoxification product, inhibits thyroid function. It actually um, binds to the thyroid where iodine wants to bind. And humans with chronic cyanide poisoning exhibit symptoms of hypothyroidism, including goiter. So this is not a woman with chronic cyanide poisoning, but it's a, a woman with goiters, to give you an example of the kind of thing you might expect. And our adorable lemurs here don't exhibit any symptoms or signs that would be associated with uh, the effects of thiocyanate in humans. So in conclusion, they seem to be using two separate mechanisms to survive cyanide, two separate physiological mechanisms. And I'm now continuing with genetic analyses to figure out what genes are involved in this um, cyanide processing or cyanide tolerance. So I'm looking at the cellular respiration genes and I'm looking at the detoxification genes, including some of the promoter regions. I'm going to be using a gene capture approach, or I am using a gene capture approach to get at these. And I'm expanding the data set past just lemurs. Um, I'm expanding it to include giant pandas, red pandas, and an assortment of bamboo rats. So, giant acknowledgement slide. As I said, this was a lot of work and a lot of field work, and so everyone who helped in the field, particularly my awesome, amazing field assistants and co-author Lydia Tongasua without whom this field work would have not been possible. And then, of course, all the funders, and I am funded to come to this conference today by Stony Brook's new Stride uh, training, computational training program. And would you like to ask any questions while we're working my the baby? <laughs> Because the question is, why would they use both? If you refer to anyone, the theocyanide would actually not, if they can excrete cyanide properly, then it would argue more for completely new mechanism, right? What you um, presented, so, because right. you basically cannot, from what I understood, you cannot excrete both. Well, so they, are, they are excreting both. Yeah. And the question well, is, no, no. Why, why did you end up down two separate evolutionary trajectories? Yeah. Um, so the answer is, 
at the same time. And I have a couple of hypotheses for that, which will hopefully be elucidated somewhat by the genetic analysis. Um, but it's possible that, uh, as I mentioned, the detoxification is limited by cysteine. They may be able to detoxify quite a bit of it, but not enough. And so they also need some other mechanism to be able to tolerate, tolerate the effect of the residual cyanide that's left over after detoxification. Um, it's also likely that that tolerance mechanism, if it is indeed in the cytochrome oxidase, is <coughs> at some level detrimental. if the amount of cyanide that is likely floating around in their blood is uh, providing a, an insecticidal quality to it. Yeah. 